Jazzy TV. Now, when I lived in Ohio, around the end of March, we would get a, a snow, of course, say on like March 22nd, and we would say, okay, well, this must be the last snow. Then it would snow again on March 26th, and we would say, this must be the last snow. Uh, then it would snow like on April 2nd, we said, and we said, and we said, this must be the last snow. Well, it's kind of like what's happening here with this what is a believer thing. I keep thinking every show is going to be the last one in this particular, particular, can you call it a rabbit trail? I like to call it an inspired departure from the script. I'm Martin Zunder. Welcome to MZ TV. I am the world's most outspoken Bible scholar. If you heard that somewhere and you doubted it, doubt it no more. It ain't bragging if you can do it. So today, I'm going to finish the important part of notes is this gentleman that wrote. I think it's a gentleman. It might be a lady. I don't know. Someone named Notes was asking about this topic. It's hard for people to believe that people they've known, that people who talk about God, talk about Christ, you see, use all the right terminology. It's called Christianese. And you really have to probe to find out what they believe. And that will tell you everything. And I've given you details of how to do that. Watch the past week of shows. So here we go. And after this, you remember, I'm going to go back to how to spoil the kiddies and the wife. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about family relationships the best way to handle things. There's a lot of problems out there, I know, with marriages, with your kids. And it's my understanding, I'm kind of preempting what I'm going to talk about, I guess, but here it is. It's my understanding that God doesn't want two perfect people together. God doesn't want you to get along perfectly with your spouse. I mean, I just it's, it, it's just so... It happens so often that people get married and then they find out they're kind of not right for each other. And then five years after you're married, you meet somebody and you think like, oh, this is my soulmate. But you can't be with that person because you're married. And of course, they're married to, to a jerk. So it's just so frustrating in this life. And many times, I mean, marriage isn't supposed to be this way. Ideally, a marriage is supposed to be a comfort, it's supposed to be an island in the stream of life. Islands in the stream. That is what we are. No one in between? Please go wash my car. Sail away with me in a boat, not a car, where we rely on each other. Those are the lyrics. Great song. But I'm an idealist, and so I like to believe that everybody has their soulmate. But a soulmate is not a scriptural terminology. It's not a scriptural phrase. Marriage is about love, and love is an action, not an emotion. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's a very interesting topic, and I like it. I'm not telling you to go, just stay with, stay with the one you're with. Love the one you're with. As Graham Nash used to sing, love the one you're with. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I heard Graham Nash say that he really hated that song. I'm thinking, why? That is an excellent song. It's like if you think you see your soulmate somewhere out there, it doesn't matter. Love the one you're with. If you can't be with the one you love. But I think that, see, it's hard to tell what the songwriter means. Uh, Graham Nash could have meant there that um, if you can't be with the one you love, in other words, the person you love, you can't be with them because like they're on vacation or they're visiting their sick mother or something like that. So if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. In other words, just find somebody to love if the one you really love is away and you can't. I, I hope that's not what he meant. But I can't imagine why else he would not like that song because it's such a great sentiment. <laughs> love the one you're with. 
There's a girl standing next to you who's just waiting for something to do. Yeah, that's good. Let's try to make each other happy. Not break any rules. Let us love and um, it's all going to work out in the end. And if it's not working out, then it's not the end. Okay. Do you remember the problem Notes had with me? He says that my identification of believers was quite a different matter than the definition of other people. And he named the people who define a believer differently than I do. But in fact, they don't. They don't define a believer differently. It's the way they apply it. The names he mentions here are A.E. Nock, James Coram, Dean Huff, and others. See, my definition of a believer is not different than these gentlemen, all of whom I love and respect. Our definition is the same. It's the application of it. I don't see who's at the plate. I call balls and strikes. Maybe not so much with these gentlemen. Note says, it seems to me that according to those guys, there are millions in the body of Christ. According to you, there are only hundreds in the body of Christ. As I said before, I don't know, but it's a lot fewer than most people think. What a huge difference. It's almost like you are saying everybody on the planet is incorrect except you. Do you remember that? I already read this, but I didn't comment on it like I wanted to. It's almost like you were saying everybody on the planet is incorrect except you. No, it's not almost what I'm saying. It's not even at all what I'm saying. There could be other people who are correct besides me. And then he says this raises red flags for him that I think... Wait a minute, this isn't what I think, it's what he thinks. It's almost like you are saying, this is his perspective. Notes is saying, it's almost like you are saying, almost like, but I'm not. It's almost like saying... Everybody on the planet is incorrect except you. This raises red flags for me. Well, you're the one raising your own red flags. I'm not raising this red flag because I never said it's almost like everybody on the planet is incorrect, incorrect except me. I don't think that A.E. Nock, James Corm, and Dean Huff is everyone on the planet. I don't think they comprise everyone on the planet. Everyone on the planet is incorrect except for me. Okay, but here's the thing. I write, you correctly note, notes, I thought that was kind of clever, you correctly note, notes, that my teaching is different from that of Nock, Coram, Huff, and others, but it's actually not, it's the same, it's the application of it. Anyway, here we go, I already said that. I'll explain why in a moment. Your next statement gives you away. Quote, it's almost like you are saying everybody on the planet is incorrect except you. This raises red flags for me, unquote. Ah, so, apparently, notes, you base truth on how many people believe it. You decide what is truth based on the reputation or the fame of the people who believe it? Now here's a hypothetical for you. If this doesn't raise a red flag for you, I don't know what will, and I'm just doing it for fun. Like, huh, I'm gonna raise a big red flag now for you, but I don't think it is one. What if everyone on the planet is incorrect except for me? What if, is that impossible? So what? What if everybody on the planet is incorrect except for me? So what? A guy who is in the minority raises red flags for you? Simply because he's in the minority? This is a bad way to judge truth. And I write to notes here. I said, do you see what this reveals about you? You lean toward the philosophy that truth lies with numbers. Now, this is what I've been dying to say for three days. Finally get to say it. Do you know what raises red flags for me? Notes. Here's the red flag that nobody's looking at. This is the red flagged elephant in the room. Teachers who insist upon the importance of the death of Christ as a necessary founding stone of the Gospel of Paul, but then insist out of the other side of their mouths that Christ not dying on the cross counts for the same thing. This raises red flags for me. Emphasizing the importance. Yes, these are the elemental teachings, the death of Christ. Let's take that one. 
But then, out of the other side of the mouth, finding out for a fact that someone does not believe in the death of Christ, i.e., thinks that Christ is God and God cannot die. So, for a fact, they don't believe that Jesus died. For these men, not believing in the death of Christ counts as believing in the death of Christ. That raises red flags for me. And these men you mentioned, Corm, Huff, and Nock, put not believing. And they don't realize they're doing this. But when they give the Trinity a pass, when they give free will a pass, they are putting not believing in the death of Christ on par with believing it. They say that the people who don't believe that Christ died are simply confused. And I know I've talked about this. I'm just tightening down the screws for you so that you never forget it. Tomorrow, I'm going to move on. I hear this all the time. They just don't have it straight in their heads. They're just confused. And I've told you and told you and told you confusion is deadly. And I, I say to notes, of course they're confused. Satan confuses unbelievers, not believers. Here we go again, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I'm getting sick of hearing this myself, but a teacher has to do this. Repetition. Without intending to, these men are being hypocrites. It's a stark hypocrisy. So the teaching of these men and others on this particular topic, their teaching is fatally flawed in their application of it. What it is, it's a wrecking ball. To say that uh, not believing in the death of Christ is just as good as believing in it is a wrecking ball to the importance and this is what I haven't gotten into as much yet, but I'm going to do it today. The importance of heralding truth over lies. Why did Paul send his companions out all the time to check on the ecclesias? He wanted to make sure that they were believing. Why bother if it doesn't really matter? Well, Paul, we went to Corinth. You know how those people are. Oh, yeah, I know how those people are. Well, we just found out that um, everyone believes that uh, Jesus Christ didn't really die. Paul says, ah, well, are they nice people? Yes, they're very nice people. Did they treat you well? Oh, yes, they treated us very well. Okay, then, that's, it's the same as believing in the death of Christ. Don't worry about it. That's what's happening here. They didn't call it the Trinity back then. I'm just taking a hypothetical there, but in our world, it's real. Some of them, in fact, didn't believe in resurrection at all. Paul says to the Corinthians in one place, how are some of you saying that there's no resurrection from, from the dead? And in my report, What is a Believer?, which is going to be a book, I talk about an article written by A. E. Nock where he says Paul overlooked the fact that some of them didn't believe in the resurrection. But, but, but that's just not true. Paul would never overlook something like that. Can you imagine somebody walking up to Paul with a t-shirt that says Jesus is dead and Paul is saying, well, you're just, you're just confused. We're going to welcome you into our fellowship. You just have some wrong ideas, but do you believe that uh, Jesus is Rose from the dead? Oh, yes, I do. But you have a t-shirt that says Jesus is dead. Yeah, well, I do believe Jesus is dead. Well, it sounds like you're saying both things. Well, yeah, I kind of believe both things. Well, both things. Well, you're, you're just confused. Welcome, friend. No, Paul would dive right in there. He would take a scalpel. He would slice the error away from the truth, and he would drill the guy like, why did you wear that t-shirt? Tell me you're never going to wear it again. Did you wear it just because it's a popular t-shirt? Did you get it at Amazon.com? Did somebody send it to you as a gift and you just decided to wear it? Do you really believe this? Well, I don't know. I guess I don't really believe it. I just like the way the shirt looks and I really like the font and it matches my jeans. Paul says, all right, that's really, but you see, Paul probes. He needs to know. 
and he's telling he's sending his friends out to check on all the ecclesias to make sure that what he taught them is being retained why is this even necessary if believing the opposite thing of the truth counts as believing the truth that's what these guys are saying man they're just confused they believe jesus christ didn't die man, good enough good enough good enough good enough what is it as good as it's as good as believing that he did not see this is hypocrisy and again it's trying to be nice because those who understand that we are gracious people and that paul is a messenger of grace they confuse this with nice people are always confusing grace with nice you'll never find me doing that and for that reason some people think i'm mean but i'm not i'm just it's tough nice tough nice so this kind of hypocrisy is a wrecking ball to the importance of heralding truth over lies in fact it puts truth on par with lies it does and yet our apostle tells us here we go again second corinthians 6 14 through 15 the truth and lies i.e light and darkness have no fellowship what fellowship has light with darkness i know you're tired of hearing it here it comes don't ever forget it what fellowship has light with darkness what fellowship has believer with an unbeliever what fellowship has christ with belial these things have no fellowship together believers and unbelievers no fellowship oh but that doesn't matter these gentlemen especially a e. knock they put truth and lies in bed together and they tuck them in and kiss them goodnight. It was thought by Mr. Nock that an understanding of the Trinity and an understanding of free will was mature truth. In other words, as long as you just say that you believe the foundationals then these other complicated teachings which they're not i told you how simple they were they're not complicated they're simple on purpose it takes satan to f them up death of christ simple the humans are incapable of believing because we're helpless simple it takes a diabolical genius to f that up and then it takes careless people to excuse the diabolical genius to to write him off as it's just a troublemaker just confusing people and then to accept light and darkness put them in the same bed tuck them in and kiss them good night you're fine love and uh, light and darkness yeah they make good bedfellows unbelievers and believers no problemo According to these gentlemen, two of whom I know personally, as I said, James Quorum and Dean Huff, believing the Trinity, that is, not believing in the death of Christ, could not possibly affect one's membership in the body of Christ. Notwithstanding that these same gentlemen also insist that the death of Christ is foundational and necessary teaching. And I think I told you how I really upset Jerry Boschman at the Sacramento conference. I made a show on this. Some of you might not remember it. I'll just go over it briefly. I was teaching on this very theme in Sacramento. Every once in a while, I bring it out. It's important. And, um, ooh, he didn't like it at all. He hated it, in fact. In fact, he told me, that um he told the congregation why are there only 49 people here there should be 490 people here he looked over at me martin you make this too hard and the reason he i'm sorry but i'm i'm imitating him he sounded like that he sounded like woody allen he's a great speaker very entertaining you make it too hard and he was thinking of his brother he goes my brother prays 10 times a day maybe it was only three and you're telling me that because my brother believes in the Trinity that he's not in the body of Christ. And so he was so upset at me. But it's not my fault. 
Your brother might walk in with a Jesus never died t-shirt. What am I supposed to do? Accept him into fellowship? Jesus never died. You have to understand it's that graphic. Somebody who believes in modalism or the Trinity might just as well walk into your assembly with a t-shirt that says Jesus Christ never died. Because that's exactly what they believe. And how is it that we would accept such a person into our fellowship as a member of the body of Christ when they believe the exact opposite of the truth? It's not like you're just missing it by a little bit. No, it's the opposite of the truth. It couldn't be more opposite. Jesus is alive. Jesus is dead. What could be more opposite than life and death? I would like to add to the scriptures, if I may, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship does life have with death? Apparently everything. Apparently we can put them into bed, tuck them in, and tell them a bedtime story, life and death. Interesting that your belief on life and death is a matter of life and death. Yeah, it is. Aeonian life or Aeonian death. So Paul was just wasting his time going on ships, risking his life, getting beaten by the Jews, going to Philippi, getting beaten with rods. A vast waste of time. Why is he working so hard if it doesn't really matter? Why is he sending his friends out to make sure that the saints have their ducks in a row? Why? Because it matters. Like hell, it matters. It matters like hell. I mean, a lot. That's it's a lot. I'm not saying like hell it matters. I'm saying it matters like hell. So I'll finish with this. this uh, the, the teaching of the death of Christ is necessary and it's not necessary at the same time. This is what raises a red flag to me. Let us be strong heralds of the truth. And when, whenever we see lies coming up against the truth, we must excise the lies from the truth. We cannot allow truth and lies to mate with each other. We can't put them in the same bed. We can't even put them in the same room. We can't put them in the same house. We have to draw lines. This is an era of grace, but it's not an era of stupid. It's not an era of mixing things that do not belong together via our Apostle Paul telling us this. So let's be firm. Don't worry about hurting people's feelings because we will answer to Christ at the dais of Christ. And sure, I would have loved to have, have 490 people at that conference. But I'm not going to lower the bar to do it. I'm not going to accept Jerry's brother into the body of Christ simply because he prays three times a day and he has a good heart and he's a nice guy. That's all great. I'm sure I could go out for a beer with the guy. But now let me ask him some critical questions. And do you know what favor you're doing people when you do this? You might be leading them into Aeonian life. So Because for all they think, for all they know, they might think that it counts. Because, well, nobody else bothered me about the Trinity. They said it was no problem if I believed in the Trinity. So they're going along in ignorance, not, not believing the truth, and you attempting to be nice to them or not make them upset, not ruffle anybody's feathers. You're letting them go on in their error, and you're basically just saying, have see you at the great white throne because they're not in the body of Christ. Not, they don't have Aeonian life, not in Paul's gospel. It's a different matter. They could be in the circumcision proselyte of Israel. I've been through that. The death of Christ is not one of the foundational teachings of the circumcision gospel. It's just Jesus is the Messiah. So a lot of these people, they could still be with the circumcision and they'll be on earth. They'll be proselytes of Israel as long as they let go of free will because, of course, that is the thing that makes you establish your own righteousness or that encourages you to establish your own righteousness, demands that you establish your own righteousness, and that is a disqualifier in both Gospels, Paul's and Peter's. Ah... <sighs>